We're going? Oh, no. <laughs> It's been 50 years of the World Economic Forum and this year's meeting sought to look to the future as we battle the impact of our past. So it was the usual crowd in Davos, Kloster, Switzerland, where more than 3,000 politicians, business leaders, activists and a sprinkling of journalists uh, were there. South Africa had uh, 50 representatives at this year's meetings, amongst them Ian Williamson, Acting Chief Executive Officer, Old Mutual, who joins me in the studio. Ian, thank you for coming. Good morning, Godfrey. It's nice to be here. You were telling me earlier that uh, it was your second meeting in yes. Davos, and I wanted to ask you what changed in terms of how you saw the meetings and the composition of the conversations between 2020 and 2017. Yeah, so as you rightly say, the last time I was there was three years ago, and it was very <coughs> noticeable how distinctly the agenda has shifted away from, in 2017, a very big focus on almost the sexy stuff around technology revolution and changes in technology, to much more focus on three topics this time. The one was the climate agenda, and that's now been taken, I think, seriously for the first time. Second one being inclusion, and how we ensure that everybody is included in the world's prosperity as it goes forward and the third item was data and the rules around data and governance for data and issues around privacy etc mm. very very noticeably different from three years ago and maybe that's the benefit of not having been there every year absolutely you notice the shift much more yeah and in terms of uh, the people who were there do you see any big shift in terms of uh, the composition of uh, who was sitting there? There was a slightly smaller South African contingent, and in general, I think a, a lighter African presence this time mm -hmm. versus 2017. Um, probably the most noticeable shift was that previously, in 2017, the keynote speaker yeah. was President Xi Pen. And right. this time it was President Trump, so right. very <laughs> different, very different from that perspective. Yeah. And actually, the the, <coughs> the China presence generally seemed to be quite muted as well. Yeah. I was also going to say that uh, perhaps in 2017 there weren't too many kids. I see there were a few kids there now uh, this time around. But let's start broadly here and get uh, your key takeaways out of those meetings that you were involved in from the time that you got there. I would imagine that would have been the Sunday or thereabouts, and right through to Friday. Yes, correct. Um, so I in the formal program, the key things I took away were, first of all, business is, business is grappling with some of the implications of the need to very dramatically shift our energy mix globally from 80% uh, hydrocarbons to something much more environmentally friendly. And in particular, there's a quite a serious conversation happening across the financial sector about the implications of that. How does it get funded? What are the implications for currently funded hydrocarbon projects? Uh, and what, is the implication, what are the downstream implications of that change right. as things go forward? The second topic which I went to a number of conversations on was this inclusion topic. It's really talking about in corporates and in organizations, how do we ensure that everybody feels that they belong, right. that they're welcome, and that they have a contribution to make and they can bring their whole self into the workplace and make the most meaningful contribution yeah. possible. Um, and as I said, the third topic around the, the data piece, the, the debate really ended up being around there's 
obviously a need for some universal guidelines around privacy guardrails. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, there's a big difference between the silly example that someone uses. There's a big difference between someone sharing a picture of me um, going to the beach yeah. and someone sharing my ID, passport, and bank details. And sure. how, does one, how does one put a framework around all of that that is yeah. sensible and yeah. allows the world to benefit from the volume of data that's starting to emerge, yeah. but also protect people in the process. And yeah. I think yeah. that debate's going to run for some Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Do you get any sense that uh, there was consensus, and I'm going broadly here again, just for your observations. Do you get a sense that there is consensus between, obviously, the people who attend, the business leaders, the political leaders, the activists, about some of the change that is required. And I ask this question in particular as it relates to climate change. Yes, we hear the, clam the, the clamor for climate change and uh, the move away from uh, uh, fossil-based fuels, while at the same time we know in this part of the world, having contributed little to climate change, we are the biggest sufferers. But at the same time, we desperately need the power that we can get, any power that we can get. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's at the, the heart of a lot of the discussion. So first of all, I don't think there's necessarily consensus mm. across the board. There are certain um, very powerful groups that I think are um, you know, in denial that there's a real issue. Yeah. But certainly every business leader that I spoke to and that I was exposed to from a conversation perspective, I think thinks this is a real issue. And not only is it a real issue, but the pace of the response has simply been too slow and yeah. needs to accelerate. So I think there's a very, there's not consensus, but I think there's a very strong and broad coalition that genuinely believes there's a problem. Sure. Having said that, uh, your point around the issues of, um, you know, who's actually responsible for this from a historical perspective, the differing degrees of development of different economies of the world, and how one satisfies the increasing demand for energy mm -hmm. uh, whilst protecting the environment. So the, the, you know, the umbrella comment was that, ma was that was made was the world needs more energy in aggregate and yeah. less emissions. Yeah. And how do you crack that? Absolutely. It's almost like the question of who will bell the cat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be belled so we know when it's coming and we run. But no one is going to be willing to be able to do that. So amongst other things, the meetings also addressed a number of issues. I saw seven key themes. They talked about the economy. They talked about ecology, technology, uh, society, geopolitics, industry. When you wrap all those things, you bring in everybody, as you said, from right across the world. So you've got China, you've got the US, etc. And yet one other conversation I picked up was on stakeholder capitalism and its appropriateness in terms of trying to uh, advance uh, development. I just wanted your observations in terms of how that conversation went and how you see it panning out, given the very different approaches. I mean, dare I even speak about South Africa and uh, the government's uh, ANC's conundrum in terms of how it advances the development agenda. So I think the stakeholder capitalism conversation is not a new conversation. Yeah. It's also a, it's an extension, essentially, of the inclusion debate that I spoke about earlier. And it is, it's definitely uh, been taken, I think, a lot more seriously. Hmm. The, the so-called, I mean, there's a number of frameworks around this. One of them was the shared value framework put out by Michael Porter in 2009, I think. Right. You know, these things have been around for a while. But there's a, there's a, a lot of practical issues, particularly for organizations that happen to be listed companies where yeah. there's shareholder pressure for quarterly results, that yes. old story. Yes. Um, and, you know, an example is um, imagine you are the CEO of a global oil major. And that sector is cash generative, so generating surplus cash every quarter. Mm -hmm. Lots of pressure from shareholders, so pay us dividends, yeah. um, return capital, but the, the underlying need at a broader stakeholder level is, you know, uh, 
a high proportion of that capital really needs to be reinvested into clean energy solutions. Right. Now, <laughs> uh, can, can the, the oil company realistically be expected to do that itself? Yeah. Or is the right model that it should return the money to the shareholders and shareholders should find a way to deploy that capital elsewhere right. to develop that outcome? Yeah. The truth is it ain't working right now. You know, right. The, the capital has been returned, yeah. but it's not finding its way at sufficient scale sure. into the alternative solutions. Absolutely. So that's the sort of debate. Yeah, that's very difficult. On. So your sense is uh, that uh, this debate is continuing, yes. but this debate is nowhere near conclusion anytime soon. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's continuing. I think there is the good thing is there's a lot more urgency in the debate. This 2030 deadline that's held out there is being used as a, it's been taken reasonably seriously, being yeah. used as a, a rallying call to yeah. say, you know, okay, guys, mm -hmm. we've got a decade. Yeah, yeah. What can we do in a decade and can yeah. we actually keep to the Paris Accord type commitments around yeah. global temperatures and yeah. what have you. Yeah. While you have a different kind of nationalism that's coming but Having into said play. that, I think there's no <laughs> there's no quick fix solution that anyone can see tomorrow. A hundred percent. Let's talk about Africa and its place at Davos. Did you see any Africans there other than South Africans? Yeah, absolutely. In generally the African countries uh, do have a, a fairly significant presence at Davos partly because I think it's a platform for them to attract foreign investment and to tell their story. So this year, uh, Ghana was prominent. Uh, South Africa was fairly prominent. There were smaller delegations from the likes of Nigeria, Kenya, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe. Yeah, so the finance minister was there as well. Yes. Yeah. And the finance minister led the South African delegation, accompanied by Minister Patel and Minister Pandor. Mm -hmm. um, there were some very constructive meetings with investors, and I think the, the ministers did a great job, actually, to, mm. to um, tell South Africa's story sure. around what we are doing to grapple with our problems, being very honest about, you know, we've got issues with ESCOM, we've got issues with state-owned enterprises, we've got a, a fundamental issue around our, um, our fiscal situation yeah. and the potential ratings downgrades that may come in due course. Yeah. We know about them, we're confronting the issues and we're trying to find solutions. Yeah. Um, there were some good news stories to tell as well around things like the automotive sector yeah. um, and particular mm -hmm. investments by foreigners that are starting to pay dividends and, and bear fruit. Yeah. Sometimes I think you know, almost internally we can get more negative as South Africans than I people know. with perspective from a distance. Yeah, so. yeah. What was your sense in terms of how that was received? I saw a report by Bruce Whitfield who was there as well and he spoke about how he sort of felt like um, there was a downgrade, if you like, of the attention on South Africa when he compares it to past years. Yeah, I think that's true and I think it is true of the African continent at large. The the agenda had shifted, I think, to these geopolitical global issues mm -hmm. and away from the great potential of Africa as a continent and a sort of Africa as a startup with a yeah. young population that could be an uh, economic driver for the future. F this year, that wasn't as prominent on the agenda as mm -hmm. it has been. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, when, when, when you look at that, uh, shall we say, diminishing interest in Africa. What do you attribute to? Is it our own inability to sell our stories? I mean, we, keep, we kept saying it last year. Five of the ten fastest growing economies are in Africa. We're going to talk shortly about Ghana now. What is it? Is it our fault that we are unable to market it? Because now I was thinking, wasn't this a proper platform for the Africa continental free trade area to be at and tell the world that we are creating this huge market for 1.2 billion people? So that story was there and was being told. I just don't. But think no one was listening. I don't think the audience was in a place where that was at the top of the agenda. Sure. So we either need to find a way to make it the top of other people's agenda. We have yeah. a lot of other competing <laughs> priorities and <laughs> things they're true. worrying about. Yeah. Um, or the you know the world's problems in the sense need to shift back to starting to see this and yeah. talk about it, engage with it. Yeah. The engagement seems to be on 
you know, more the China US issues, uh -huh. uh, rather issues of that nature. Yeah. And so the, the Africa agenda, if you like, has just gone down the yeah. global agenda. Not yeah. necessarily, I don't think, for reasons of our making. Yeah. But for reasons of just global. Absolutely. Issues. But what it also means is that uh, uh, I'm reminded of that saying in uh, Animal Farm, if you remember, donkey, when things were hard, he says, I shall work harder. We need to work harder <laughs> to get that interest back onto the African continent. But you were saying to me that there was a bright spot called Ghana. Yes, yeah, so the Ghanaian delegation was was punched above its weight, shall we say. It was. Uh, I, I think. Taking um, space from bigger boys. Yes, they hosted a, a, a very good dinner with a very sort of <coughs> market-friendly pitch for investment. Hosted by the president, supported by the finance minister and the foreign minister. They had um, Tony Blair come in as a, a guest speaker who runs a foundation which has some interest in seeing Ghana succeed. Um, and I think they, they did a good job. And they, they tell a, a fairly compelling story around yeah. the economic growth that yeah. they are achieving, which is the highest in Africa at the moment. The fact that they have the port for the African Free Trade Continental Agreement and they see that port as a, a big opportunity, um, and that they prepared to put in foreign investor-friendly policies to attract capital. Yeah. So that I think has has they almost the the darling of the yeah. the Africa potential investment destinations right now. In Absolutely. The community. And uh, that's a story that you like as well, Mutual, isn't it? Because you're already there as well. Yes. What do you see? Is that something that resonates with you? Do you see the truth in what they are saying? Yeah, no, our, our, our business in, in Ghana is actually is growing quite nicely. Uh, we see the potential and we obviously as a, um, as a financial services business that really serves the man in the street, mm -hmm. what works for us is a fast growing economy where the, um, the, e the economic base is broadening across sectors mm -hmm. and that, that's what <coughs> we see happening in Ghana so that's a, a very good lead indicator for us. Yeah. What about the other countries around the African continent? I was having a conversation with a senior economist at one of the banks the other day and we were talking about the fact that East Africa is the place to be. Even when you do a map of Africa in terms of GDP growth, the East African region is the fastest growing followed by the West and then of course you have the dogs at the bottom of the <laughs> I was going to say ocean <laughs> which is <laughs> Southern <laughs> Africa. Why are the other regions not so prominent? Or did you hear them? They were surprisingly low-key. Uh, I think Kenya sent the, the finance minister from a political representation perspective. I mm. saw very little business representation. Um, Which is interesting. It is interesting. I, I, my take is that what I've seen happening recently is the, the East Africa bloc has been forging a a sort of a Middle East relationship into ah. Dubai and what have you. And those, those flight paths between Dubai and East Africa and yeah. that trade Grow. route there is, is growing. Um, GDP growth across the region is very good. And again, we, we are, our mutual is there and yeah. for that reason. Yeah. Having said that, I think on the ground, it's a little bit of a disconnect for me. If I see the published GDP growth in Kenya, and I yeah. see what's happening in Nairobi at the moment. It's quite tough. Yeah. Um, you know, there's the the property cycle has, has looks a little bit like Johannesburg. We've had a, <laughs> a big boom in construction, <laughs> and they're actually struggling to let, yeah. let all the space. Yeah. Um, the uh, there's businesses that are putting out profit warnings on the on the stock market. So sure. there's something that's not quite gelling uh, for uh, me with uh. with the macro yeah. picture. Yeah and the on-the-ground ability of businesses to make real progress in the mm. short term. Yeah. I know you were very busy in Davos, uh, Ian, meeting, obviously, the formal sessions, as you were saying earlier, and obviously meetings that would have been arranged by your team for you to meet some of the key business leaders and perhaps potential partners uh, for you to do business on the continent. So I wanted to know your key takeaways out of those meetings other than the formal ones that we spoke about and who you were able to see. And of course, you can tell me in confidence uh, the deals that you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Davos is not one of those places where you necessarily strike new business deals. Um, <laughs> most of my meetings were with uh, corporates that are suppliers to us, so really just checking in on, on progress on projects that we're driving, for example, on the technology side, mm. and just sharing with the, the CEOs of supplier companies 
challenges that we have on a particular project, how that's going, can they help to push it along, or things that are going well, and just really keeping that conversation open. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, other one from a, this is very much an insurance sector specific issue, is we right. meet, I meet with the reinsurers. Okay. To understand the takes on on you know how do they see the global risk patterns, given the weather and the climate issues and what have you, had a very interesting conversation with uh, Swissery around uh, how they're thinking about uh, agricultural and crop insurance, right? Which has been a challenge for us recently. Yeah. And trying to understand at a global level is this, you know, what's their take on it? Yeah. Um, so that's more the nature of the conversations, yeah. rather than you know, striking a, some, a new deal for some business <laughs> that's going to rise <laughs> in the short term. Well, I was hoping that you're going to give me that one big deal. I do remember years ago reading somewhere that, uh, yeah, there are some deals that can be done, but perhaps not concluded, but certainly yeah. the conversations beginning uh, are there. I wanted to take that conversations that you had with those guys in Davos back to the conversations that you are having here with your own customers here in South Africa and see if there's any uh, kind of correlation and also just how difficult are the conversations you are having with your customers Customers right now, given the economic environment that we are currently facing here in this country. Yeah. So obviously, it's uh, it's it's very tough for for everybody, certainly in the South African core, which is our core market uh, yeah. in the South African environment. Um, you know, with GDP growth just just positive, and consumers under a lot of pressure. The retail, I think, any business that's in the, the retail sector is is really struggling to get growth. Um, so, the, so you know, we fundamentally sell insurance protection, whether it's for your car, your house, on your for your life to protect you if you get ill and can't work, and long-term investment business. When consumers are under pressure to meet their monthly grocery bills and pay for their cell phone, mm. It's the last thing that you they know, want to our, our things are not priorities in their lives. So trying to, to keep the conversation going with customers around yeah. this is important. You need this stuff. Yeah. You need to set it aside. It's the responsible thing to do. It's yeah. tough. Um, so it has been, it's been a tough three years, I would say. It has. In that, Absolutely. In that sense. Have you had any opportunity to engage government did you get any chance to engage the minister Absolutely. when you were in Davos and uh, I just want to understand sort of the nature of the conversations so I think it's it's really around the business business in South Africa I think generally this is not a single corporate view <coughs> is very supportive of what government is trying to do we think that direction is absolutely right right the pace of execution needs to speed up dramatically. Okay. And it's a question of we're willing to help, yeah. I think. Yeah. We'd love to help, yeah. but we need to see clarity and actual concrete decisions being taken. Yeah. And well some of them are tough decisions, and we know that. But true, but, but, but the, the other side of the conversation is that when you listen to government, when you listen to the politicians, you hear that businesses are hoarding Cash. cash businesses are holding on to money on to their balance sheet like i remember a, a figure being bended around the other time i think it's about a year or so ago of uh, almost like half a trillion rand sitting on companies balance sheets that's not being released back into the economy so that is probably true um particularly for companies in the industrial sector where the, you know typically that cash is going to get deployed in a very big capital project yeah with a long time horizon so the the environmental things that need to be in place in order for that capital to be released into investment are really mm -hmm. the issues of policy certainty and just generally certainty around things that create risk for that capital. Okay. So in my mind, and I'm not an expert on this, but in my mind, for example, if you imagine in the mining sector, you've got an opportunity to invest a few billion into a project that's going to exploit a mineral body of some description. Yeah. It's a 10 to 20 year thing. There's uncertainty around the mineral rights going forward. Okay. There's that issues around the power. There's issues around the power supply. Sure. 
there's issues around that uh, will always be there just around the price of the commodity in question. Yeah. The more of those uncertainties government can help to take yeah. out of the equation, yeah. the lower the cost of capital and the quicker the capital will flow and get Absolutely. invested. Uh, that, that's the bottom line. So clearly these are political decisions that need to be taken and business yeah. wants those taken and then and done and dusted. Yes. And some of them are not going to go away, unfortunately, because as you can see, even the conversation around the expropriation of uh, land without compensation continues and is getting various twists and turns. Yeah, and it, it just those things just need to be landed. No but it makes it depressing, yeah, doesn't never it? No one's going to like all the answers. There's always going to be bodies in business included that's not going to like some of the answers. But certainty, yeah. that's what we need. Absolutely. Ian, thank you very much for coming in today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. Nice Ian to be here. Ian Williamson, Acting Chief Executive Officer of our Old Mutual Group, joining us for this CNBC conversation about some of the issues that took place in Davos, Switzerland this year.